So Manoush uh, Elizaday is a professor in electrical computer engineering, assistant professor. Uh, she did her PhD at Davis, uh, UC Davis and Stanford postdoc. Um, she's already winning all kinds of awards uh, in her relatively short academic career, uh, NSF career award. She's won a major teaching award. Um, and she's really one of the foundational people in a very strong controls group at UCSB uh, across a number of departments. You've heard from you know, people like Igor and, and uh, we'll hear from her today. And, um, and with that, uh, we'll let you go ahead. Manish. Thanks again. Uh, can you share? Thank you so much, Mark. Can you see my screen? Um, it tells me sharing is paused, which is, I don't understand why. Hmm? Here. Um, you, do you see my screen or not? Who can share all panelists? No, we don't. We don't see your screen. There should be a button that says resume sharing or. Right, and I click on it and it doesn't. Uh, all right. Let's see. Do you see it now? Yes. And is it in full screen? Um, not, not yet. It says the old no. paradigm. No, but is it in full there screen? I, I think I put it in full screen and that's what paused it. So I guess I'm just going to present like this. It's okay. It's big enough. All right, cool. Um, I apologize. Well, I mean, I can try to put it in full screen again, but I don't want to. Did it pause it? It, 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 the screen went black. I don't know why. Uh, so, all right. All right. So all right go, go, yeah. go from there. Let's keep it like this. All right. Cool. Cool. So thanks everybody. Uh, I'm, I've given overview talks previously a couple of times at IE. So I thought I'd focus a little bit more this time on some recent research work that we did uh, with my PhD student, Nathaniel Tucker. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about some of our recent work on machine learning and real-time optimization algorithms for electricity demand management. But before I do that, I wanna sort of repeat to you the, uh, a little bit about the exciting transformation in grid operation that uh, motivates our work. Uh, so, so the classic or old paradigm of power grid operation essentially took electricity demand from customers like us, um, like an uncontrollable and random input to the power system. And so the whole operation of the power system is built around serving this random demand reliably and with the minimum possible cost, as you heard from a lot of speakers today. Uh, and so this essentially meant that on the previous day or hours ahead of operation, and this is still what is done today, uh, electricity generators submit bids that reflect their costs to an independent power system operator, which is, which is a nonprofit entity. Uh, retailers like Southern California Edison accurately forecast their customer demand, and then they also give it to this independent power system operator, who then solves a large optimization problem to find the best or reliable and minimum cost generation mix to serve our demand. And so the issue with this operational paradigm is that it's already dealing with, you know, essentially randomness on the demand side. So it's very hard to also deal with randomness on the supply side when you add renewables like wind and solar also in the generation mix. And so this essentially uh, enabled the clean energy transformation in power systems, which essentially relies on multiple, you know, additional new principles, which is, you know, we can integrate renewables, perhaps also in distribution systems where customers have solar panels on their roofs and they try to consume the solar essentially behind the meter instead of injecting it into the grid. This happened at the same time as multiple exciting transformations, for example, transportation, electrification, as well as the opportunity for increased customer engagement at the operational level of the power system. That is, we want to bring customers into the control loop of ensuring that demand and supply of electricity are balanced. These are demand response and demand side management programs, which you've heard about uh, you know, a bit today. And that is the focus, uh, main, a main focus of the research we do in, in our lab. And that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today, as well as of course, storage, which you heard a lot about today as well. Um, so the challenges that I wanna to talk to you a little bit about today is that the grid has uh, you know, traditionally relied on having essentially accurate representations of supply and demand behavior, right? We want to have good forecasts of not only what demand and supply are gonna do now, but also in the future. And so while forecasting uncontrollable demand behavior, you know, this is 
very, some very, there, are, there are some very good methods out there to do this. We don't have much information about what demand would do if it is exposed to essentially changing conditions of the grid or you know dynamically chosen prices or incentives or signals, what have you. We don't really have good models of this, and hence you know this motivates the use of data-driven algorithms in this case to learn about how demand responds to signals. Demand is us; we are humans. We don't have good mathematical models of humans. And so second, another concern is that, you know, we have to solve all these sequential dispatch problems, not only at the, you know, uh, for example, at the level of California, but also we're, as we're pushing optimization of, uh, you know, the grid to the edge, you know, small communities of customers have to solve these sequential dispatch problems, which have you know, inherent uncertainty in there that even the best predictor cannot eliminate. So we want sequential dispatch uh, optimization problems that have to deal with high levels of inherent uncertainty when we solve them. So I want to show you a little bit about some of our work in addressing these challenges. The first challenge is, as I told you, how do we quickly learn how customers respond to prices or incentives, uh, perhaps um, so we learn how to best use them in our operation of the grid. And also the second challenge is how do we use these or make these sequential decisions when we don't have really great forecasts of you know, demand and supply. Um, and so with the first challenge, this is a paper as uh, published in Transactions and Smart Grid, where we want to essentially learn how customers respond to prices or incentives. I'm an electricity retailer. I, have, I am exposed to daily conditions of the grid. That's the variable MT that changes with, you know, every day. And um, my goal is to minimize my operational cost. That's the function C that we have up top here, which depends on the daily conditions, but also on the demand, which I would like to optimize through the use of a price or a dispatch signal, whatever. And that's the price signal P of T that I'm choosing, right? In response, I'm going to what um, I'm going to see a demand, which I don't have a good model for. Right? I don't know what D of P of T is going to look like. So clearly, I cannot op minimize my operational costs in a single day. I don't have a good model of how demand responds. Our goal is to make sure that we learn what essentially how we can post these prices over a period of, for example, T days. And so the, me the, the, the metric that one uses here to see how good an algorithm is, is called regret, which is essentially the difference between the cost one would incur if, to, if they were to use an algorithm to learn how essentially to make these cost minimizing decisions over a period of T days minus the cost that they would have incurred if they had a perfect model of the demand and hence could post the best possible price. Right. So this is a very abstract way of modeling this. There's many things that can be integrated into this. And what we did is we studied the effectiveness of a well-known algorithm in machine learning called Thompson sampling in achieving this. Um, it's a very simple simulation uh, that I'm going to show you here, which looks at how this uh, quantity regret grows with days, with the number of days that we're running this algorithm. Uh, it is uh, very desirable that you know clearly this not this function is going to grow with time because it was the sum of my cost over a period of, of, of a number of days minus the optimal cost but my my goal is to see it essentially flatten and as you can see here it, it has um but i know i show i'm showing this to you not because i want to essentially promote this simulation what i want to talk to you about is a point that we observed when we use such data-driven algorithms to learn how customers respond to prices. So in a lot of cases in power systems, we're used to dealing with having good models of everything. So, so that's to make sure that we can reliably operate power systems, right? We want to make sure that there is no constraints that are violated in the transmission or the distribution system of the power grid when you, when you essentially post a dispatch signal. Uh, the problem with these algorithms is that they might not be able to guarantee it unless we carefully design uh, the algorithm, the data-driven algorithm to take these uh, reliability constraints into account. And that's what I'm showing you here. So again, very simple simulation uh, and that and we have essentially kept it unrealistic in, in per, uh, you know, by purpose to make sure that we can highlight the evolution of the two learning algorithms in achieving our goal, which is essentially to get electricity demand to match the blue profile you're seeing uh, here. Uh, but we don't know how demand responds to prices. So we have essentially tested the performance of two, two of these algorith algorithms based on Thomson sampling. One of them doesn't take into account that demand should never go above 100 per unit. 
The problem with this is then on, you know, in the unconstrained learning algorithm or the unsafe learning algorithm starts by posting prices that really excites a lot of customers and gets them their demand to be really high and hence violates this reliability constraint of the power system. Whereas if we have like a conservative learning algorithm that takes into account these reliability constraints, we would have that th this algorithm post really low prices to begin with to make sure that it is not going to uh, violate that, that constraint shown in green. And hence, you'll see in time, both of these algorithms around day 28 are closely matching that desired profile we had, but one of them uh, incurred a bunch of violations uh, in doing this. Clearly being more conservative comes at the cost of increased regret. So the more uh, essentially conservative my algorithm is, the higher the regret is going to be. And that's why this curve is showing, but clearly that's a price for reliability that we need to pay if we want to use data-driven algorithms in, in safety critical systems like power system. So then that brings us to the second challenge that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, which is, you know, we have all these uh, dispatch decisions that we need, need to make in power systems. And they usually, as I said, a lot of these optimization algorithms that we are used to dealing with in power systems rely on having good forecasts of the future. And when we go to the level of, you know, communities and things like that, it's really hard to have very accurate forecasts of what everybody will be, you know, needing or doing. And also, you know, very small scale, for example, solar or things like that. And so, um, what we do here is we use online optimization algorithms that don't depend on forecasts of the future and still provide essentially performance guarantees with respect to an all-knowing solution. Um, and, and, and the first application of these algorithms I want to show you is, is with regards to community energy storage. This is a, essentially a storage system that one a community of customers, small community of customers can share instead of each investing in their own storage system. And they can use it for multiple reasons, whatever you, you want it to be. What I want to show you here, for example, is a simulation of 10 commercial buildings in Los Angeles, each equipped with a solar panel, and they're sharing the community energy storage system with the purpose of using the solar energy they're producing um, behind the meter instead of injecting it back to the grid. So we are using our online algorithm to essentially price what each of these users should pay in order for, in order for the community energy storage system to serve essentially uh, the energy storage request that they're submitting uh, for, uh, for, for storage essentially. Um, and, and the curves you're seeing here, the first is just their load without any solar. The second curve to the mid in the middle is their, what their load looks like when you essentially add the solar uh, that they're producing. And you can see that the load is going below zero or negative because they have extra solar production that they cannot consume themselves. And then the last curve to the right shows you what happens when we use our online algorithm to essentially absorb uh, uh, or, or store the excess energy and then you know, let the users consume it when they actually have energy uh, needs. A second application of these algorithms that we have toyed with and we uh, are, are actually um, have published in the Transactions of Smart Grid as well is a uh, as an algorithm that allows essentially a um, a public electric vehicle charging um, parking lot wherever it is, it could, could be a workplace uh, charging facility to essentially allocate incoming users to charging spots and also perform smart charging and not requiring knowledge of everything else that's gonna go on in the parking lot from that point on. Uh, because, you know, customers can have, you know, complicated and, you know, arrival times, departure time, charging needs, the parking lot can have solar uh, production, for example, that has to be consumed hopefully by the electric vehicles that are charging there and so on. And so I think, I, I think this is a, essentially a, a, a good application of these algorithms because it's really hard to forecast what everybody will be doing in the parking lot and what energy needs they're going to have. And so relying on those forecasts make our life, I think, even harder instead of making it simpler. Our algorithms still provide performance guarantees for this. Um, so essentially, they, they start by uh, allocating customers uh, through an online heuristic to all these spots and then start deciding how to charge them and how they should pay for the part for the use of the parking spot as well as for the energy that is being delivered to them. Again, the very simple simulation here shows you why this is needed. So for example, consider if you have a 
workplace charging facility, if in the morning you allow everybody to park in a spot and leave and go in, what happens is if you arrive uh, you know, later in the day, you might not have a par parking spot available. So you might not receive charge even though you're des in desperate need of charge. Whereas if you had an allocation scheme that actually has people paying per use, and then depending on how much utility they receive from being allocated to a uh, to a parking spot, then you could have increased utility of the users as they come in during the day. So with this, I, I want to wrap up this talk. Uh, I know I talked a lot about essentially algorithmic advances and not really demonstration of these technologies in, 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 uh, in the real world, but we have actually been working uh, on that for the past few years. Um, it, we have several uh, essentially uh, we, we, have, we have been involved in several projects where we're demonstrating the uh, efficacy of smart charging algorithms um, in collaboration uh, with uh, perhaps uh, the most important one in collaboration with Slack National Lab. And I want to also acknowledge uh, the, the sources of funding that have supported our lab throughout these past few years, the National Science Foundation, California Energy Commission, UC Office of President, and also generous uh, seed support from the uh, Institute of Energy Efficiency, which has really helped us uh, essentially uh, start our research in new directions. Um, so with that, uh, thank you, and I will take questions. Okay, so, um, so for those of you in the audience who want to ask Manoush questions, uh, please uh, type them in if you have something. Um, in the meantime, um, do any of our panelists uh, have anything they want to ask Manoush to follow up? And I know, I know Igor had some questions for you, uh, but he was, he's saving those for the panel, I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, do, I do have a number of technical questions, but I think we can, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in the depth of the algorithms. Uh, and, you know, which, which, which the time doesn't doesn't allow us to 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 discuss in detail. It's gonna be, yes, gonna be we fun. can definitely discuss. I, you know, the the ten buildings are sure they, they have really interesting dynamics. So I, I want to dig into that at some point. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay, I guess you guys can take that one offline. You, you yes. Know. Um, okay. Any other uh, any other things from from the audience uh, from Anoush? Okay, Manoush, thank you very much. That was great. Um, and uh, I now understand better what, you know, what you guys are up to right now, which is great.